Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, thanks so much for spending your time here listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I have a conversation with somebody who was recommended to me by Joey Dodson and also by Jonathan Pennington, uh, none other than Drew Johnson. Uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, but you know I just had such a great time in this in this uh, discussion uh, with this episode today. Uh, you know, as you guys all know, you've obviously been listening to the episodes. Uh, I've been very fascinated by uh, the kind of philosophical approaches to the Bible, um, the relation of philosophy and theology. It's just been really on my mind lately, um, and I hope that I will have a chance to really go deeper into uh, those kinds of ideas towards the end of the year and into next year uh, as I transition out of university and therefore have a little bit more time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to jump into this conversation for you guys today. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Drew. So Drew Johnson is an Associate Professor of Biblical and Theological Studies at the King's College in New York City, Director of the Center for Hebraic Thought, Editor at The Biblical Mind, host of the Center for Hebraic Thought podcast and co-host of the OnScript podcast. Before that, he was a high school dropout, skinhead, punk rock drummer, combat combat veteran, IT supervisor and pastor, all things that he hopes none of his children ever become. So, as I said, I'm really excited to jump into this episode today. Uh, You know, Drew is such an interesting character, he's got such a great story and and on top of that, uh, you know, we just dive into some really kind of deep ideas to do with uh, biblical philosophy, theology, um, and, and you know, I know that you guys are going to really enjoy this. So, uh, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Drew Johnson. Okay, Drew Johnson, I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. Um, at high recommendation from from Joey and and uh, Jono, uh, I think that's his Aussie name is uh, is Jono or could it, no Penno Penzo. Penzo. That's it. Yeah. Is that a typical <laughs> Aussie move? It's it's a very typical Aussie move. We like to okay. um, uh, so so I guess we would call you Jono um, would be the the, the classic. Right. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about your kind of journey through theology. Um, but I guess the place to start, um, I wanted to kind of phrase this question like this, you know, punk bands fighting drug dealers in the Amazon, you know, now, uh, you know, dealing with hard questions in theology. Um, can you take me through that whole kind of canon of events uh, that <laughs> led you to, to where you are now? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, cause it's sure. a long story, but, um, essentially I was like a lot of kids, uh, in the eighties is when most of this, um, turmoil happened in my life. Parents of divorce, latchkey kids kind of left on our own. Uh, dad wasn't in the picture for a while. And so I was looking for meaning. Look, what I'd say now is I was looking for male companionship that I realized yeah. I now can look back and just say, Oh, young men need uh, other men in their lives. And when that's not there, they'll find it any way they can, whether that's in a gang or, um, you know, so I, I became a skinhead with a bunch of my buddies. Um, and it was only later when I saw a movie called This is England, which is about British skinheads in the 80s, that I realized by watching that movie, oh, because the movie very clearly showed skinheads were basically guys without fathers. And I went back through all of my friends. It's like, oh, yeah, none of us had fathers. There's the common <laughs> connection. So we made yeah. brotherhood. Um, fortunately I have my father in my life. Uh, he was just, he didn't, we didn't live in the same state. So that was a big driver. I mean, of everything that happened to me from that point on is I was looking for significance in a punk band, which, you know, was just 
a bunch of fun. I worked in an Irish pub every night and drank a lot and didn't do well at school. So I ended up failing out after three years, which in America, we'd say I had three freshman years and then they asked me not to come back again. Um, and then I didn't really have a lot of options. So I joined the military um, because I came from, my uncles were in the Marines in the Pacific in World War II. And my dad was in Vietnam. So the military was kind of considered a, you know, decent option for people in our family. Um, although none of them talked fondly of it because they were all combat vets and they hated it. But, uh, but it's something that everybody did. And so I joined the Air Force. I always joke with my students, you know, I wanted to join the military, but I ended up joining the Air Force instead, which I don't know how the Air Force is viewed there, but it's kind of the softer military. Um, <laughs> Softer, gentler military, but uh, I did. I was in a ground combat unit, so I spent all my time with Army Special Forces and you know digging foxholes and that kind of stuff. So we 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 looked like the Army, but we were actually part of the Air Force. Um, and I would volunteer for every combat rotation I could get. This is the '90s, so there wasn't a lot of action, as they say, for yeah. the military. There were no real wars going on, except the war on drugs down in South America. And so. I had the opportunity to volunteer to go down to the Amazon in Colombia. And basically we didn't, I mean, we say fight, but essentially we just tracked drug runners and we tracked the FARC, which is the leftist guerrilla movement there. Um, and then they'd come take shots at us every once in a while, just to, you know, keep us on our, on our game. But it was, um, it was mostly like a lot of combat rotations is sitting on your duff 99% of the time boredom, uh, and, and then pee in your pants for about 1% of your time. So uh, <laughs> hoping that you're not going to go home in a body bag. Um, it wasn't anything like my uncle, my dad, you know, he's wounded in Vietnam. He, he was a real soldier or whatever. This was, this was just child's play down in uh, Colombia. but it gave me, you know, but also helped me realize um, what a lot of young men want is they want that feeling of like, I, I was in combat. I survived and did that thing. And you can tell your stories and then what you realize is as soon as the shooting starts, you don't want to, you, you couldn't be anywhere else if you wanted to, right? You, you just, you just want to take off and leave that whole thing. Um, so I think that helped me sort out who I was in the middle of that. I became a Christian. Um, when I was rotating back to the States, I had this guy who was uh, part of my dad's church who I was talking to and he was not afraid of me as a skinhead. I mean, he like just took me on whole cloth. Um, turns out he, he was working on a PhD in the Old Testament at the time. Um, hmm. Took on all my, I had lots of questions. I was very skeptical of the whole Bible thing, like all the way down. Where are the dinosaurs in this thing? How does this fit together? And he just took them seriously. And if he didn't know an answer, he'd be like, I don't know. What, I mean, do you want to look into it together? I mean, if you're serious about it, let's look into it together. If you're not, let's work on something else, right? Um, and so that was, that was uh, again, great to have a male companion who took me seriously, even when, I mean, I was spouting a lot of nonsense at that point in my life. And then I had one of those conversions, like day and night, I was one person. And then the next week I was a completely different person. So people talk about being born again. I, I had something like that happen to me that was kind of a mark in my life that I couldn't deny. It was one of those historical events that I look back and say, look, I got to explain what happened to me somehow. And the when I read the Gospels and uh, the, the Book of Acts, I was like, "Well, that this this feels familiar." So that's kind of how I got the turn into Christianity. But I still had this low tolerance for BS, as somebody once told me. They said even as a child, you had a very low tolerance for BS, unless it was my own BS that I was spinning out. <laughs> um, this is the short version, mind you. I think I prefaced this whole thing with this is going to be the short version. And uh, yeah, so this guy, no, no, this is great. Continue. He, he yeah. convinced me to go to a seminary where. Um, Again, I got to really put all my questions to the test and throw them and see what, what the answers were. And I had great professors, great classmates. Um, it was a really encouraging environment from, I was a little surprised. I really thought I was gonna go to seminary and I was basically gonna find out none of this is true. It's all a sham. And when you get down to the Hebrew and the Greek of the biblical text, you know, wink, wink, it doesn't really say what we think, you know, what we're telling people. And so I was a little bit surprised at actually how good the biblical texts are and how faithful the, the, the copies are. And the Hebrew Bible has its own set of issues about uh, where it comes from, but, but that there's something coherent that holds the whole thing together uh, was, was shocking to me. And then being around other people who were faithful Christians, born and raised Christians, but they were just as skeptical as I, and they put just as harder questions to, to the whole thing, the, the church and 
So I, it was really comforting to me that I was surrounded by a bunch of normal people who were also Christians, who were also skeptical and really wanted to hash it out. Um, so I, unbeknownst to me, uh, I started working at a church as a pastor uh, after that. I wasn't planning on that. And if you'd asked me, I would have said, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but I, I ended up doing that for a while. Um, I did a degree in analytic philosophy um, and started teaching philosophy part-time at a, a public university uh, or a state, state university. And, um, and that's when I was looking for the, like, okay, I've, I've heard the theological answers to the big questions I had. Now let's hear what the philosophers. Now this is a state university, so they're all atheists minus one. Um, there's one uh, theist in that uh, department that I know of. And, um, Come to find out, Christians were very widely respected in that department. I mean, like, hmm. uh, these were all atheist philosophers. I was in the psycho I did my undergrad in psychology in the same university. There, they talked about religious people as just these kooks that put blind trust in things and just step out, you know, in faith. And they black box everything, right? Everything is just this mystery where God does it. Um, and so I was really kind of ashamed. And I was a new Christian at that time. I was really ashamed to even admit to people that I was a Christian. And then I actually believed in uh, most of that stuff. And then I got in the philosophy department and they were all like, yeah, we don't really have any better philosophical explanations than Christians do. At the end of the day, like we don't have a trump card hiding down here and go, aha, you know, that's, that's a sham and this all makes sense. And I was just shocked that these really pleasant, fair-minded atheist philosophers were just looking me in the eye going, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a valid philosophical system of thought. What can I say? Um, mm -hmm. And so they really encouraged, uh, that encouraged me. I did not like analytic philosophy, I have to admit. I didn't like the style, but I liked the people, uh, and, I, and I learned a lot um, doing that. And so eventually I did my, uh, when it kind of came time to do my PhD, um, you know, I'm reading scripture this whole time and thinking through it. And uh, I keep seeing a lot of the things I learned in philosophy, a lot of the same conversations were going on in the Hebrew Bible. I was more interested in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and I kept on trying to figure out why philosophers generally excise. They, they may let the New Testament into the conversation at points. They may let Ecclesiastes into the conversation on uh, an existentialism class or something like that, or Job. But that's as far mm. as it goes. Um, but that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, that those could actually be carrying out a philosophical impulse. It was a no-go from the start. And so that kind of became my pet project I worked mostly on epistemology, which is theories of knowledge in the scripture, that they yep. care about knowledge and that they have robust things to say. And then um, eventually uh, through connections with Jewish scholars and thinkers in Israel, I actually got into this more general field of, it, is the Bible philosophical? Is, if so, what kind of philosophy is it? Uh, that question, mm. which I'm currently working on, that's my, my big um, propaganda machine that I'm spinning up right now is yes, there's, there's philosophical stuff going on and let me teach you how to see what they're doing with philosophy. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I appreciate you sharing all that because there's so much that I, that I really want to jump into. Um, <laughs> I like that you put it as a propaganda. Don't we all have a propaganda machine oh, that we're trying absolutely. to say? <laughs> you know, I've, I've given up I, on trying to hide it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's brilliant. But, um, well, you know, something, something that, um, I guess, uh, really drew me to be interested in the Bible was this, uh, this passage that I read in a, in a theology book, I guess I was getting interested a bit beforehand because I was reading a theology book, but kind of suggested that um, they used to think of theology as the mother of all sciences mm -hmm. and philosophy a handmaiden. Mm -hmm. And that kind of made sense to me because I, because I had already been thinking, man, the Stoics give us this idea. And I remember being taught that, 10 years ago when I was in church, you know, and then, you know, there's this idea. And I remember being taught that in this place and, um, you know, not that it's all going to be parallel, but, um, I'd like to hear from you, like what, so your background in psychology, theology, and philosophy, that's like, that's like my ideal, <laughs> you know, if okay. I could, you would probably know more than I, I would after all of that. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. Um, but, but definitely not. But, um, what, what has philosophy taught you about the Bible that you think maybe, um, some people miss because they kind of only have the, the, the theological understanding. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. And I, I should preface this with, 
Um, and w people will disagree on this. In fact, Jonathan Pennington and I might disagree on this. Um, I don't know, but I don't find the philosophy theology divide to be extremely helpful. Um, yeah, I, I think for artificial sake to have a discussion about, I'm talking more about philosophy in this sense. I understand what people mean by it, but when we talk about, you know, why there was no such thing as the number zero, a null placeholder in European mathematics up until the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's because we were holding on to Greek theological ideas about numeracy and that, that, that numbers existed in true, infinite, unchangeable forms in the heavens, and you can't have a true, unchangeable form of zero, right? It, it's a the, now, notice it's not a philosophical problem, it's a theological problem because you believe yeah. the gods are tied into the notion of, of forms and ideas. Um, and you can say the same thing with Galileo and, and Kepler and their discoveries were locked in Greek theology, views of what God is and what, why a circle for Aristotle and Galileo was the perfect form, but ratios, the Neoplatonic view of ratios was the perfect form for Kepler. Um, so we can talk about those being philosophical ideas, but they're not actually philosophy, they're theology because they're tied directly into their view of the divine, uh, what, mm. however they conceive of that. So I, I'd like to less separate those out and think about how they're actually almost always interconnected some way. And then, and then we can talk about them artificially as two separate things. Um, and now I've lost your question because I got no, off on my own little ramp there. Well, I, I wanted to jump in anyway. Like I, I really think that that's, that's a, such a perfect observation because I mean, in, even in Stoicism, you know, you kind of expected to have a whole bunch of presuppos presuppositions uh, for example, you know, the, you know, not that you're expected to, cause you know, you're expected to find out what is true. I think that that's ultimately what the philosophers are trying to do, but you know, you, you kind of think, okay, cool. The whole cosmos is one well ordered whole, you know, and each individual human is interconnected with everybody. We all have a spark of the divine mm -hmm. natural reason, you know, and um, the, the, the kind of, universal nature which is you know reason or the logos and so you know there's i i agree like i i have been led down a path of being interested in theology through philosophy but it doesn't seem like there's much of a a big divide because they're right. all trying to think about the beginning and the end right they're trying to yeah. think about that but i guess the ultimate question was what uh, and, and will this the question's now changed um you know, how do you think theology and philosophy can best merge to help you understand both maybe? Yeah. If I can go the, through scripture to answer that question, please. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, if you think about scripture and we say, well, there's scripture as revelation and then there's theology, which kind of riffs off the ideas in scripture in some way. Um, what, it, what that simple move does is it says, okay, scripture is like the data, uh, the information that I have to work with, the, the mud that I'm going to make bricks out of. And then, and then I'm going to mine that for what I really want to say. And I, and I actually think there's some value in that. And um, I, I think there's real genuine value in that contextualized text to modern context. You, you do quite a bit. Um, but what you miss is this, that, um, that the book of Genesis and its connection to the book of Exodus, for instance, or you could say the gospel of Mark, which is where I did a lot of my research in the gospel of Mark. Um, they have their own philosophical programs that they're, they're trying to carry out. Now, when I say that to philosophers, they look at me askew and they go, okay, what do you, what do you mean? By, if they give me the time of day, they'll say, what do you mean by that? Uh, or they'll put up an ejection. Wait, these are just stories about Jesus or the stories about these ancient Hebrews. I'm like, well, yeah, but when I started studying philosophy, people told me immediately to go read a story about a crotchety old man wandering around, unsettling everybody he met, never proffering what he, what he believed to be true to anybody, just tearing down everybody's belief and their confidence in themselves. Um, and everybody told me that that was the beginning of philosophy, right? Mm. Um, so you can't tell me that a story doesn't count philosophically somehow. And I think there's actually something very philosophically power about, powerful about stories. Um, and in stories and allegories and metaphors are used throughout um, the ancient Greeks and throughout European enlightenment as well. Books on meditate, you know, meditations of people are used, of course, with Epictetus and, um, and Marcus Aurelius. So there's all kinds of literature that counts as philosophy. So this is this book mm -hmm. I have coming up, uh, Biblical Philosophy. I have to make this 
this big case, like what counts as philosophy? No group of philosophers in this world will ever agree on what exactly philosophy is. So I just said, look, look, let's just talk about philosophy is the practice of speculating about the nature of things as they actually are, apart from any mm. particular instance. It's speculating about the nature of a chair apart from any particular chair you've ever sat in. Um, and then let's just think about the various inroads to doing that project. I can tell you a story. I can write a poem. I can write a treatise. I can put it in modal logic and languages that people, normal people don't understand and say that, aha, I've there proved it through modal logic, right? There's all these, all these different ways. So when I looked at scripture, I just said, okay, how do they do this? These ancient Hebrews clearly had sophisticated, abstract thoughts about the world. So how did they show us their thinking? Um, and it actually is not difficult in some ways, you know, anybody can do this. You can just read through the scripture in any good English translation, and you're going to see patterns of thinking emerge over and over again. Uh, so the one I worked on originally was, um, well, here, let me pick a really obvious one. Truth. Okay. In American English today, I don't know how it works in Australia, but in American English today, when people hear the truth, they think of the truth as the opposite of false almost as if it's a light switch. It's either true or false. It can't be anything in between, right? Um, we say they're binary opposites or polar opposites of one another. Um, and so then Christians in America have made this really big deal about getting down to the truth, holding on to the truth, selling the truth, propagating the truth. Um, and I'd say, okay, fine. What you're actually doing is selling a view of, of what we call philosophical modernism. Uh, you know, so it's mm. early 20th century thinking based out of mathematics and logic that you can prove things to be true or not. Um, now I can take all that same language uh, and then say, that's not how the biblical authors talk about truth. Um, they actually have a different conception of truth they're working off of. Um, ironically, it's not the conception that a lot of Christians are working off of. They're working on the, the American conception they've been handed. Um, and there's, and I'll, I'll just put it this way, there, the ancient Hebraic view of truth is a better view because it, it's, uh, it comports more with our scientific understanding, our rational understanding of the world today. So, um, so what do they believe is true? Sorry, I got off on this truth tangent, but it's really no, no, easy. This is, this is beautiful. Trust me, I'm catching all this. <laughs> uh, so how do, we, how do we figure out, what did they say and how do we figure out what this means? Well, you can do simple things just by look at when, when do they call things true and when do they call them false? What's the context under which they're calling things true and false? Um, and then you, you see some very clear lines of, of rhetoric emerging. So they call a, a tent peg. This is my friend Yoram Hazoni, who wrote this book, uh, The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture, where he notes a road is called true, a report is called true, a tent peg is called true. And you're like, wait, how is a tent peg a road and somebody reporting, you know, like a, like a news report? How are those true? And you just have to say, okay, there is a way either – they have no coherent concept of truth, or there's a, something that ties all these together. And when you look across these, it becomes fairly obvious that truth is uh, something is true when it does what it ought to do over time and circumstance. So a mm. tent peg is meant to hold down a tent over winds and rains. And so when it does that over time and circumstance, Hebrews will say it's a true tent peg. A road is a road, uh, you know, a true road is one that takes you over time and circumstance of traveling. It takes you to where you ought to be. Um, and the same thing you can imagine with a report, a report accurately to the degree that is necessary uh, over time and circumstance tells you what you need to know uh, about this thing that happened. So now we're in the world of scientific epistemology, how scientists know things. Because a scientist can go like, oh, that's exactly what we do. Someone gets a harebrained idea that something might be true. And we go, well, it's not good enough for you just to say that you think it's true. We're going to actually test it. We're going to put it through various circumstances. And if what you thought was correct, um, this thing should hold to be true, should prove to be true over time and circumstance. Actually, the, the way we use it in American English is uh, the, the only way we use this is with carpentry and faithful spouses, like being true to your wife, being true to mm -hmm. your man over time and circumstance. So we do have this, this version of truth in our language. We just don't, it's not the one that comes to the surface when we think about the truth. So when Jesus says in the New Testament, uh, he doesn't make up Greco-Roman notions of truth, which Greco-Romans have their own conceptualities of truth that are bleeding in there. But he says, uh, I'm, I am the truth, which, okay, now you're dealt with dealing with a person who's truth. So that's already breaking the category. Um, 
I'm the way, the road, and the life, right? So there's some way to live, which these are all stoic terms, right? The way and the life, these are all ideas mm. of uh, peripateo, to walk alongside your master and learn. Um, but he's saying there's something over time and circumstance that will hold true about him uh, and the teaching that he gives. And Paul uses the same language of walking in uh, this peripateo language, which is famous from the Greeks, right? Uh, but there's no way in which you can say Jesus is the truth in the same way that you would say, like, it's just objectively true that the sky is blue, which obviously is not objectively true because I lived in Scotland and they don't even know the sky is blue. On <laughs> <laughs> the space station, yeah. the sky is translucent, right? So, yeah. Um, so I think that's a, that's a simple example of a term. I, I, it goes much deeper than that. That's just kind of a concept and a term that match up really nicely. By the way, I didn't deal with false shaker, this, this term in Hebrew. It, it means uh, things that are uh, untrustworthy, right? Mm. Uh, and so, so over, over time and circumstance, you can't trust this thing. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in how you play out their abstract thinking in the real world. Um, yeah. And you're not fighting for some objectively absolute real truth. You're now looking for things that hold up over in time and circumstance to be the thing that they're supposed to be. And mm. I think that's, that, that's the model you get in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's really fascinating. You know, it is, it's, it's obviously like one of the biggest challenges, right, of bringing such an ancient text into modern times is just mm -hmm. the way that we think about the world now is just completely different. Um, I, mean, I mean, you even see this with uh, people's conception of what the term God actually means. Mm -hmm. I mean, in yeah, America, yeah. they think completely different to even people in, in, in Britain. Um, and then, you know, you see you see Epictetus, like, you know, saying, you know, hey, cry out to God. And, and a lot of people who are interested in Stoicism, very uncomfortable with that. And it's like, well, maybe that's because you think of God like your evangelical, um, you know, uh, prosperity gospel preachers think, mm -hmm. you know, down there in, 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 you know, Southern Texas, not in the way that Epictetus saw the idea of God back then. Um, so how does this, how does this, uh, kind of relationship to truth then transfer over to um, the idea of God uh, and how has the, you know, according to your research, how has the conception of God changed over time to what we now think in today's society? Well, that's just, that might be a massive question. question. <laughs> yeah. That's everything with Scott. What is right? God? <laughs> yeah. You, you think it's a common sense question and they're like, Oh, I need three hours. Um, yeah. I, um, well, I think the issue of God, so there's a, there's kind of a recently famous book by a New Testament scholar called Kevin Rowe, um, who he actually argues that there's no real way in which the, um, uh, the Stoics, Stoics use of the term theos, God, can actually line up with Paul's, when Paul employs this word theos, he's, they're actually talking about such radically different things in such, yeah. they're in their own traditions where the language, the concepts and the life that goes along with it are so different that they can't, they, you call them rival traditions. They can't be referring to the same thing in any real, real way. So that while both speaking Greek, they're not speaking the same language. Um, mm. I think he goes a little bit, a little too hard on that line. I think there is some way to translate it over. Um, but he's highlighting the problem is so that Americans, when they think of God, they think of Jesus. It's like the same thing when they think of Messiah, they think that means God. It's, well, no, the first two Messianic kings were Saul and David. They were just humans who also happened to be big schmucks. They were, they were pretty, uh, pretty horrible guys at the end of the day. Um, and so I think it's what, and this is what I think Christian, if I could just speak about how Christians read the Bible and how it doesn't help always in this, in this field is, uh, you have to say, let's read the Bible from scratch and let's pretend like you, you've you never heard any of this before in your life, right? And so we're just going to stick to what we know. No Christianese, you know, that, that weird language that Christians speak. Um, no double talk. Let's just say, you know, let's as we run into the terms, let's pretend like we're explorers in another land that's never run into this before. And it's a really hard sell. Now, if I have an hour or two with somebody, I can walk them through a passage. They see the benefit of it. They want more. Like it's an easy to flip people over and say, okay, this is, this is worth it. But if you hold this ancient text hostage to your view of truth or your view of salvation or judgment or violence is another one that's really big these days. 
um, it, like all, all independent free floating objects in this world, it'll just sit over here and say, yeah, sorry, no, right? Uh, that's just not how it works. And um, it, it won't be able to fit into the angles. Um, you, you know, there'll be all these leftover lingering problems with your view. So I think it's much easier just to say, hey, the biblical authors had deep, thick, abstract concepts about the world. Let's just see what they, they are. And then let's see if any of this makes sense given what they th seem to be thinking about the world. So justice is an easy one, low hanging fruit here. In some ways, justice is an easier on road because uh, the American conception of justice, and I'm sure the British sense in, in, in general, is very close to the uh, biblical sense of justice, right? That it should have mercy, that humans are basically equal to each other, that humans, except in Texas, uh, humans, human life is valued more than property, right? There are many states in the United States where you can kill somebody just for being on your property legally, right? Yeah. Um, so that would not fly with scripture, but that's a departure from the Hebraic view. But, you know, if I'm walking down the street in New York City and someone collapses and falls grabbing their chest, everybody on the street stops and helps them, right? Um, mm. That's not a universal view of human interactions with strangers that has been carried in all cultures, right? Uh, so in Greco-Roman culture, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. If the person was of a lower class or status, it would be too shameful to stop and help somebody uh, in that situation. So you would just walk on mm. by, right? Um, and Jesus tells a parable to this effect that, that that kind of view of humans has crept into Judaism with the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? They've taken this honor and shame class culture from the Romans and, and injected mm. it into their, their views. So there is this like, um, and, and it's difficult because essentially what I do with students is I, uh, I have to, what they call foreignize them to the text, help them to realize they don't actually, you, you know, you've seen the Prince of Egypt, but you have no idea what the book of Exodus is actually doing. In many ways, the Prince of Egypt is a, is a very poor representation of the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful movie, beautiful music, but it's a very poor representation of the text. So let me get in there and show you why this text is, you know, I'm the Socrates of the Hebrew Bible, why this text is not doing what you think it's doing and why it's doing something much better than what you think it's doing. Because if you think it's just a bunch of oracles being spewed from God like Delphi, um, then there really is only one response is you just obey, 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 right? Um, and we're in, I think what you get in there and we talk about rationalism, the rationalism of the Bible. I challenge my students at the beginning of the semester. I'm like, okay, when, when I hear the word faith, which I won't use, um, you know, if I could go down in the street in New York City and ask somebody, what does the word faith mean? Most of the people are going to say something like close your eyes and step off a cliff. You just blindly trust somebody. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, we're going to read through the Hebrew Bible, but you can do this with the New Testament as well. Show me one place where God ever asked somebody to close their eyes and, and, and trust him, like blindly. Mm -hmm. And instead, what you're going to see is that God comes to humans and reasons with them over and over again, giving them signs and wonders, uh, direct, voracious historical reasons to trust him. And then he will ask them, okay, now, now I need you to trust me and do this thing that I've asked you to do. That, to me, betrays a view that humans are reasonable, rational. They can be reasoned with, even God reasons with humans. Uh, which means that reasoning is kind of a uh, in one of those ways in Christian theology in which we'd say we image God. We are images of God and that we reason with one another, which uh, doesn't make reason part of philosophy. It makes it part of the covenantal structure of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. It makes reasoning part mm. of what it means to be a good human to other humans is to take the time to reason with them. Um, it also doesn't assume that reason alone through your words is ever going to be enough. Uh, so one of the ways in which God reasons with people is through signs of power um, to show them, I'm going to ask you to do this thing and let me show you that I'm powerful enough to carry out my end of the bargain, as I've said. Hmm. Um, so that reasoning is never just a mental sport um, as it has become in the academia, uh, academia today. So. Yeah, no, that's, you, that's really, I'm like a cat. You're just going to have to keep corralling. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, please. This is, this is awesome. I, I'm loving this. And, and is, is there any relationship even to um, uh, say the conscience, you know, between, uh, you, you know, it's kind of like that thing that kind of speaks to you every so often and says, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. And you don't listen right. to it. And then you do that and something terrible happens. And it's like, is that yeah. kind of the same kind of, uh, you know, reasoning that they see happens between say God and humans where, you know, you're being shown something over and over again and you're like, okay, fine. 
I, I get it. Okay. I'll listen to that, you know, conscience right. that tells me, is there any, is there anything there? <laughs> Um, that is a hard question. Okay. I'm going to shoot from the hip because you know, Americans have to use gun analogies for everything. (laughs) Um, where, where I would put that, um, I do think this is correct is if you're talking about how the biblical authors would have that same discussion, uh, it's Mm. not, uh, the Freudian, you know, id and ego, uh, battling it out, uh, on your shoulder. It's actually wisdom, uh, inner dialogue Mm. and wisdom. So the wise and discerning one is the person who can see, right? Uh, and so in the Hebrew Bible, I really like, it's the same thing in the New Testament as well, but people think of it as this old crusty patriarchal text where men are in charge and women are these subservient victims of everything, which I'm just like, you clearly have not read this text. The women are in charge of almost everything in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, <laughs> although there are some formal structures that the men are in charge of, but women run the show essentially. And that's a good thing in many ways. Um, because it's often the case that the biblical authors are going to highlight women get what's going on. They see past the superficial features and they understand. And it's that ability to see past the surface, right? To, you know, when you have kids, to see past the temper tantrum and realize, oh, they haven't eaten in four hours, right? That ability mm. to just discern what's going on beyond the presenting symptoms. And it's because when, it's often women who are able to see what's actually going on. They're able to intervene appropriately. Um, so it, it takes it off of that kind of should I, shouldn't I wrestling of the conscience, which I think probably derives a lot from our version of it, at least as kind of Freudian uh, psychoanalytics. And it puts it more in the once you, once you understand what's going on, it's not hard. It's not a big moral leap to then go do what you know needs to be done, unless it's a scary, you know, standing up to somebody or, you know, a couple of times I've um, on the subway, I've seen uh, a man. It's always every time I've seen it, it's a man like clearly giving signs that he's going to physically abuse the woman he's with. Like maybe even he's not going to do it on the subway, but as soon as they, you know, step off and get away from people, he's going to hit her or something like that. Yeah. And so um, it's, so it's not like I'm presented with a should I or shouldn't I, it's more, I see something going on. I know I need to like get in between these two people and make sure. And, and also knowing all those dynamics, you can't control a lot of that. Um, and in some ways, I think this is where Aristotle is helpful, his discussion of habituation and the Stoics pick up on his view of habituation as well. Like you have to practice doing that stuff. You have to imagine yourself in that circumstance. So when we talk about wisdom and discernment, almost as like these mystical properties that some people have and some people don't, the biblical authors put it much more in like the um, tools and trades category that it's actually something you learn to do. It's like learning a language and you have to keep up the skills um, and then once you have them, then you can discern what's going on and you can intervene appropriately. Um, hmm. So I think they're interestingly, even in medieval, or sorry, not medieval Judaism, but um, Hellenistic Judaism, you see this turn from this uh, intense view of biblical wisdom, which is like seen beyond the surface. And once Hellenism comes in, it all of a sudden becomes Belial and these demons that are constantly tempting you to do this thing, right? So I think this is, I, I don't know the history of this, but it sounds to me like this is uh, more uniquely a Hellenistic problem than it is a Hebrew problem. And by way, when I say Hebrew, I mean the New Testament, which is written by Hebrews, mostly two other Hebrews, right? So. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a really interesting kind of um, concept that, that now it's kind of, yeah, it, it might be making sense to me or I might have the complete wrong direction here, but it kind of seems like uh, this might be a bad, bad analogy, but you're kind of trying to move beyond the kind of, um, uh, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's right, what, you know, what's evil, what's good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe like what Nietzsche would have said, you know, beyond good and evil. Mm-hmm. Now it's kind of like, I'm watching people, I'm watching events, I'm watching the world around me and I'm seeing things for what they really are, which is allowing me to almost have kind of a, um, a rebirth back to that kind of animalistic intuition sort of like, you know, I, right. I see everything for what it is. Um, and that there could be a logical structure to that intuition that it's not just yes. like this bare mystical question mark sitting out there and some people have it and some people don't, but yeah, but it, yeah it can be fostered. And, and what, what is the difference say between like revelation and inspiration? Is, is this just something yeah. that we kind of haven't really brought forward into, in, into our understanding today? There are lots of theologians and biblical scholars that have 
very robust discussions of this. I think, um, yeah. I, I don't find, again, it's kind of like theology philosophy divide. I don't find the revelation uh, and reason divide to be helpful at all. Um, because I think there's something magical about human knowing. And I mean magical in the sense that it really is fundamentally mysterious and mm. awe inspiring. So um, I'm sure you've had an experience where you did, you know, people talked about something, you didn't really get it, or maybe it's a skill or a trade. And then all of a sudden, like, it's just, aha, I see it. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Michael Polanyi, who's this uh, mid-century philosopher uh, who talks about the Eureka moment. And, and that there really is no philosophical explanation for what happens there. But it's, it's almost like you're on a journey and, and all of a sudden the world opens up to you. Now, was that reason? And the reason it opened up to you is because you probably listened to somebody who was guiding you to see the thing that they were trying to show you. Uh, mm. And the example I use, and I think he uses it as well, is x-rays. You can't learn to read an x-ray. Like maybe you can see broken ribs. We could all see that. But, but really be able to read a, 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 an x-ray you have to have somebody over your shoulder who's expert in it and helps guide you. And I've been told by my friends who, who are able to read x-rays, doctors and radiologists, that essentially you just do this hundreds of times. And at mm. some point, all of a sudden, you can see the, the, um, the hairline fracture you know, in the bone where you, you couldn't see it before, all of a sudden you can see it. And now you can see it in new x-rays that they put in front of you that you've never seen before. Um, now, which was that reason or revelation? It was a logical process. You put yourself through the paces. You had an expert guiding you, helping you to go like, oh, don't pay attention to this, but pay attention to that. Um, it, th th those two categories don't seem to be helpful at all. I will say, because I know Joey and Jonathan are going to listen to this, uh, that, <laughs> that there is... Um, there is this uh, category in scripture where God just gives a, a vision um, where people just see things. Um, and so maybe I could hold that out as one special category on the side within Christianity or most religions. They have this kind of like someone has a special sight. But I want to also give more credence to the fact that being able to see a hairline fracture or a collapsed lung on an x-ray, which are difficult things to see, there's something very like, uh, mis fundamentally mysterious about our ability to do that. It's one thing for me to do it, but then to be able to train you to do it is is uh, near magical. And that's the in that uh, if I were to package all of that discussion about learning to read X-rays, how would the Hebrew authors describe that? They would call it wisdom, uh, mm. discernment. They have like Greeks have one word uh, for wisdom, Sophia. Uh, there are eight different terms for wisdom in the Hebrew. Um, and they're all about skill, competence, discernment, understanding. We have a lot of English words we can slap on here. Mm. But it's really this training, it's, and it never happens on your own. You have to be dis discipled. You have to, like, submit to somebody else's training. And through that process, all of a sudden, things that were always there but you couldn't see, you can now see. So it's not like they become real. It's They just become mm. real to you. Um, and the biblical text... I think that's the mode that feels most present in the prophets and, and the apostles is I have been shown this thing, not just blindly the world opened up or, you know, not just the world opened up to me, but through struggle and submitting myself to the authority who is now Jesus and, and God, I now see this king, this invisible kingdom of God thing or empire of God, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I now see the features of it. You know, when I see these things that I used to just think were Roman powers decimating everybody, I now see that this is actually part of this plan. Um, and here's what's interesting to me is the biblical authors don't say like, well, I'm the oracle who sees it. Sucks to be you. Glad I can see it. No, they say, let me train you how to see it as well. And let put your bodies through these motions so that you too can see this thing that I'm seeing so that you'll know that it's real. And then you can test it to see whether it's true. Mm. That this this mindset, this framework of uh, what some older Egyptologists call, or Assyriologists, they called it the the skeptical mood of the Hebrew Bible, and the, uh, and I would say it carries into the New Testament. That kind of critical intellectualism, I'm using their words, the critical intellectualism of the Hebrew text, and the skeptical mood that I might be wrong about what I understand. I would say the only, if you want to look for what does this look like in the modern world, the only place you're going to find this is in scientism, the way we think about science. I have mm. an idea. I have to test it against reality. I might be wrong. And reality has the right to kick back and tell me I'm wrong. Mm. So I don't know where to put revelation 
in that. I mean, I, 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 I have fuzzy contours in which I think it can fit, but I think the, the dichotomy has to be kind of uh, re readjusted. Yeah. And, 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 you know, something you said there, I've, I've heard you say this before. I really like your view of kind of reality isn't something that should um, be detached from, right, you know, right. your study of the Bible and it should actually enhance your ability to understand what's going on in there. Right. Um, right. What, what, what are some of the, the biggest things that people often think today? Like, you know, like, Hey, reality check, you know, Bible's not real because this is, you know, what are some of those things where you've kind of found, well, no, actually it, it, it's helpful to understand that because of, you know, this, this, and this. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. There's so many of these like reality check type uh, memes and gifts out there that people float by me and I'm, I, I, I can only float my, I roll my eyes. I mean, I think <laughs> there's a question of how the text came to be in the shape they are. That's a separate question. I think we can set aside and say there's editing, there's all kinds of processes that brought the text to us, not the new Testament so much, but the, the mm -hmm. Hebrew Bible. Yes. Um, and, and, and I, I don't find that problematic at all. Um, but I, I do think people who just want to say there's no history to any of this, right? So I still run into people um, who will just say, you know, you say Jesus and they'll say, well, if, if he even existed. And I'm just like, nobody thinks that Jesus didn't exist, right? But this is a common, like, I would say internet atheist. I don't know what to call these guys. The guys that get out there and they look for sites that support their already pre-existing views, like Christians sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some historical issues there that are just fundamentally misunderstood. People, I still hear people saying like, oh, the New Testament is from the second and third century. It was written by the church, backdated to, you know, it's like, well, I mean, there were scholars that believed that at one point, but um, even, you know, most biblical scholars today, I think it's still true to say this, are not Christian or confessional religious people. Most of them are atheist or agnostics. You know, most of my colleagues are not religious people that I work with or that I, that I work with internationally. Um, and even they are saying, no, the New Testament texts are probably all from the first century, maybe John as an exception. Um, mm. So that kind of where did the text come? And then you have to think about what conditions created the text? What kind of people were this excited to copy this text and to transla translate it into so many different languages so early on? Um, there's a historical movement there. Rodney Stark, a sociologist, has written on this, you know, how this weird Jewish sect became the most common religion on the face of the earth. And as a sociologist, he's like, this just needs explaining. Numerically, it needs explaining. This is a difficult thing uh, to explain. Okay, so yeah. I, don't, I don't think that answers your question, though. Um, maybe I can push it back to you and say, are, are there certain reality check things that you hear that you think are interesting or unanswered or need to be answered? Well, I mean, you know, you've got the classic example of what you mentioned before. It's like, you know, like dinosaurs in the Bible, things like that, you know, and, and I think, I think the, the, the thing that really made me interested in this side of thinking and even around the question of what is truth, um, you know, this is probably the case for many people, uh, was listening to Jordan Peterson's lecture series on the Bible, you know, like, and just thinking about, you know, we've talked about stories so far um, right. as well, you know, thinking about how stories uh, are a type of truth in our lives, right. you know, that tell us who we are, what we're doing. And, um, you know, what you even listen to someone like Alan Watts, and he says that something that, that Jung taught him was that despite all of his kind of evangelical work to do with Zen Buddhism and Eastern philosophy. He's always a Westerner, you know, because he's got that, that deep ingrained Christian thought in him, you know, that's yeah. kind of carried through the ages. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in kind of, yeah. How, what Jordan Peterson did for me was he, he, he took a look at these stories and he said, well, this is actually true psychologically because you act this out in your life every single day. So mm -hmm. maybe don't look at it from that perspective, but if you look at it from this perspective, it's exactly spot on. This is exactly what humans are like, you know? Right. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I, I think it, what we call them JPE in my circles, it's the Jordan Peterson effect. It doesn't matter yeah. what Jordan <laughs> Peterson says. It's, yeah. I, I had this tidal wave of young men who are going like, what do you think of Jordan Peterson? I watched some of the videos. I'm like, yeah. 
doesn't seem particularly interesting to me, but um, <laughs> I was more interested in why it was so interesting to them. And I, I think yeah. I have some of that finally, but um, yeah. And, and I think that, yeah, and obviously he's taking up uh, Carl Jung's uh, lines here and extending them yeah. out a little bit. And I think I, I would say, uh, well, let me back up and, and go go back to Alan Watts that you cited there earlier. I think that's a really seminal insight. I would correct, it's not Christian, it's not a Christian belief that he has or seed in him. It's actually a Hebraic uh, seed. The yeah. New Testament does nothing new under the sun. It basically regurgitates uh, the Torah and the prophets hmm. uh, and the conceptual order of the Torah prophets in a new Hellenistic context. So I don't, I don't think there's much new in the New Testament in that sense, conceptually. Um, but I do, th I, this is an open question. So I'm going to say this very timidly. Um, you do really have to wonder, there's this, um, I forget the name, is it the Winthrop? There's a, a famous name for this question, but basically why didn't science develop in China? Why didn't science develop in India? Like they had clearly had the intellectual powerhouses, you know, China invents gunpowder, but then just uses it for fireworks for celebrations, right? And doesn't use it for anything like engineering wise. Um, yeah. Of course, Europeans got a hold of it and just found ways to kill each other with it, right? So, yay, Christians. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, th that question, I, I keep coming back to that because I do wonder, can you have a system of thought, like you're, you're the, the soup in which you swim conceptually, that begins with the premise, none of this is real? Right? Mm. Everything is fundamentally deceptive. Uh, the, the wood is fundamentally deceptive. Um, and, and maybe in the Hellenistic theology, everything that's real is actually up in the heavens and we have some muddied way to get uh, access to it. Um, and, and Brahmanism, and it's, it's the same way in Hinduism, it's, you know, and Buddhism, the, the daughter religion of Hinduism, it begins with all of this is false. Everything is false, right? You, you know, the goal number one is to understand that me and that bookcase behind you are the same thing. And once you get there, then you're okay. Yeah. Does that actually offer you conceptual grounds to do what we consider normal scientific or rational investigation of the world, right? Um, and it really is. And it, it, you have the same problem in Mesopotamia and the same problem in, in Egyptian thought as well. Um, that, that They had a mythopoetic view of reality around them. And there's a real serious question that has not been answered. Maybe it can't be answered is, did that fundamentally cripple them? By the way, the Greek, Greek thought has the same crippling. Um, you know, Plato is telling you nothing is real. Aristotle tries to ameliorate that position a little bit and, and value the earthiness of things. But even he is a little disgusted by the idea that um, that forms are meshed down into the, the earth and mud. Mm. Um, so can I can I go from nothing is real, everything is deceptive to I'm going to study the tensile stress of iron and let it tell me what's real about the tensile stress of iron. Uh, that's a, like, that actually is a blind leap of faith conceptually. I don't know of any way logically or philosophically to get from that fundamental presupposition to actually submitting yourself to the reality of rocks and steel and seeing what it has to tell you about reality. Um, and I think the proof of this is I was, I was giving a talk about science and scientific uh, epistemology to a group of, nuclear weapons labs engineers and um, people who worked on IBM Watson. Do you know the IBM Watson machine? It's like a... Wow, it's so funny that you mentioned that. I didn't know about that until yesterday when I was looking up a speech <laughs> okay. to, to text. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So, you know, if you don't know, it's basically just a, a very smart, quick computer that has human-like neural pathways, uh, to, it tries to replicate some aspects of human thinking as best we know. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm asterisking everything I'm saying here. Um, so I was talking to a bunch of people who work on this and help design these things, and they work in nuclear weapons lab. And I was telling them basically, you know that old story that scientists were just objective, we just clinically observe the world, and we collect facts, and we put them into a larger pile of facts, and then we develop theories, and and they're all nodding along because that's what they've all been taught. I'm like, yeah, no philosopher of science thinks that's true, right? Um, nobody for the last 75 years thinks anything like that is true. Um, and and I, then I say, here's what philosophers think is actually going on. And I just give them the normal story of science of how scientists actually know things. Um, and, and they all agree. They're like, oh, yeah, 
I did, I, if you'd asked me, I would have told you that other story, which is basically out of 1940s modernism, scientific uh, positivism. Mm. But now that I hear this story you told me, that's actually what we do in our labs. That's actually how the real social grease, you know, and that basically science relies on scientists trusting other scientists blindly just because they're accredited by the mechanism called science, right? So they don't know that that scientist is doing what they're supposed to be doing. They just trust in the system, right? So mm. they have more trust in the system than they can have in any one individual. And it's not bad. Science, you, you need trust, right, to make everything work. And so one of the guys stood up at the end. He's like, I heard everything you had to say. It sounds right. You're right. Like, I think that's what we actually do. And I was relieved to hear that. He said, but explain to me this, when I plan, you know, when I engineer something, it actually works the way that I thought it would. Like, how does that work? If I'm so wrong, um, and I thought this is a great point, and I think it's one thing where Christians and theologians and anybody who's doing speculative thought, including the Stoics, uh, could learn from scientists, is, you know, theologians can talk a lot of fluff sometimes. They can say things that just sound good, you know, and biblical scholars too, and me as well. We can say things that sound poetic or like, whoa, that's deep. Um, but scientists, if you say like, here's what I think is going on, you actually have to put it to the test in the real world to see if it holds up to be true, like in the biblical sense of the word mm. true. And if it doesn't, then scientists have at least the integrity to say like, well, I guess I was wrong in some way, right? And I'll maybe I'll modify my view or I'll modify the experiment or I'll tweak until I can get reality itself to help me understand whether what I think about reality is correct or not. Hmm. That actually is thinking that I could say that sounds very much like the prophets. That sounds very much like the Hebrew Bible. That sounds very much like the kinds of things Jesus and the apostles say. Um, and that I can get on board with. I wish more philosophers and theologians thought about their ideas that way and said like, you know, I got this general idea about what humans are and what we're made of and how we work. But I probably need to go into, you know, like um, a trailer park. I don't know if you have trailer parks, you call them caravan parks or, yeah. you know, like, yeah. you know, maybe I need to go into a, a poverty stricken community and see whether my ideas actually work out, whether they're true to life in some way. Um, yeah. And, and so that you're seeing more of that in theology, not so much in philosophy, a little bit in philosophy uh, today with embodied trauma and, you know, pe people looking for different perspectives. But that's the part that I that I find interesting. That whole discussion that where I was just blethering on about all of this science stuff, <laughs> I don't I don't genuinely know how you have that if you start with the premise none of this is real and it's all deceptive. Hmm. That that really does seem to create a, a no go bridge in some in some conceptual sense. It creates a no go for the things we want to think about today. So in yeah. some ways, I want to say like. I know it's ancient old Hebrew thought. It comes in this Hebrew language, which looks really weird to us, but we're actually more familiar with it than we are with Greek thought. Uh, we think much mm. more like ancient Hebrews did than ancient Greek people. And I think, I think we'd actually be shocked if we were transported back in time into Roman culture uh, to see how they viewed the world. Yeah. Well, this is just, it, it, this is all such fascinating stuff. And I think that what's so cool is that we're moving in a direction now where you know, like you say, a lot more people are kind of coming over and starting to think about these ancient texts in this way, mm -hmm. not just, you know, Hey, you know, believe in this and have faith. It, it's like, how can this actually conform to our reality of today? Um, cause I mean, you know, like we mentioned earlier, whether we like it or not, we all have those perceptions in, you know, ingrained in us mm -hmm. through thousands of years of cultural development. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, there has to be some correlation there, but I only, I only have a couple more questions for you. I want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, I, I guess, uh, okay. I'll save that one for last. You, you have said that uh, Nietzsche has, uh, Christianity pegged. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of uh, expand on that a little bit more, because um, I, you know, I've I've only read a little bit of Nietzsche, and and you know, yeah. and then you know, then I had to put it down. I was like, okay, cool. I'll come back to this <laughs> when I am a smarter, wiser person. Fair, fair um, enough. Fair you enough. know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, in what ways do you think that that that's the case? Yeah, I, Nietzsche is interesting on so many fronts, but. Um, I, I best understood Nietzsche after I went back and read uh, his first work, Birth of Tragedy, which was his doctoral work. And then uh, they published, Cambridge has now published his private notebooks. And so you can actually, and this is where like 
for me, this blew the roof off because I thought, okay, this is what Nietzsche chose to say. In his, and if you haven't read Nietzsche, just trust me when I just say there's some crazy stuff that he chose to publish and he pointed to as his best work. And, and you're reading it going like, really, this is, this is what you think your best work is? Um, it's a lot of poetry and aphorism and, and weird, weird, weird stories. Um, but he was a philologist by training. So he worked on the Greek language um, and he was not a philosopher by training. Um, not that there were real necessarily philosophers by training in his day anyway. But, um, and uh, I think when he looked at the New Testament text and, and you get this from his private notebooks, he had, uh, he was a shrewd thinker. He was a very tight, systematic thinker. And you get that from his notebooks, I think. Uh, you don't get it from his published works as much. Um, and you realize he is slicing. I mean, he, in his notebooks, he's writing down some, uh, some logic problems that Aristotle set forward that he didn't think Aristotle got right. I mean, this is not the Nietzsche most people are thinking of, right? Mm. And when he looks at the New Testament, because he's, he's a Greek philologist, so he reads and teaches the New Testament in Greek, right? Um, and so when he looks at it, he basically takes it to be uh, a Greco-Roman document uh, with this Hebraic twist on it. Um, and then he, I think, uh, I haven't published this, but I've got an essay where I basically say he picks up his, his view of what's going on in the New Testament from a friend of his who's a historical theologian. Actually, it's his, one of his best friends. Um, and his best friend has this view that basically Christianity, when Jesus didn't return, you know, Jesus promised to return after he ascends into heavens. When he didn't return, Christianity turned into a theological sport. And the theology basically became a, a world fleeing theology is the term that he uses. Um, so that basically Christianity is all about getting out of this world. And again, he, he basically accuses it of, of it being like Hinduism, Brahmanism, uh, Greco-Roman. The, the goal is to escape the prison house of the body, Gnosticism or something like this, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, it, it's like, it was one of those periods where I admired some of Nietzsche's thought so much. And then I was so disappointed that he picked up this particular view because as I was reading, I was like, where is he getting this from? This doesn't in any way match what's going on in scripture. Um, and so it kind of saddens me a little bit when I hear that Christians often appropriate the same view that the goal is to get to heaven you know, when somebody dies, they'll say things like, oh, they graduated, they've gone, they've moved on. Uh, mm. uh, as most biblical scholars know, scripture doesn't really teach hardly anything about what happens to you when you die. It's very mm. silent on the topic. Uh, essentially, you go into the grave and that's it and you await resurrection. All these other stories about going into the heavens, they're all derived from two or three places that I don't actually think support it. But that's people can argue about that. Um, but if your hopes are on going into the going into the heavens when you die, that's kind of fundamentally kind of dictate how you view present reality. Like the goal is that's where the good stuff is. It's really just a platonic view that the church condemned early. But you know, church condemning things doesn't ever stop modern Christians from doing anything. <laughs> um, and so it, it kind of skews the entire discussion of, of Christianity and scripture. And even the view, we find this, you know, I'm a big fan of the Hebrew Bible. So everything becomes when, when you talk to Christians about the Hebrew Bible, they're like, well, which part of this gets us to Jesus who then saves us so we can go to heaven, right? It's like that train of thought is so direct in everybody's minds. And if you say, well, here's what the biblical authors, including, um, I would say, Jesus through the Gospels, Paul, all these other people, here's what they seem to think very clearly. You're born, you live, you die, you go into the grave and you await resurrection. And then you're awaiting this renewal of the heavens and the earth. The, the heavens and the earth are actually kind of the way they're supposed to be, but they're broken right now. That, that demands a very different treatment of the current situ situation, right? You're not, we're not yeah. trying to get away from this. We're not running away from our problems. You know, I, Facebook, sometimes I, probably, I need to stay away from Facebook because it just makes me mad sometimes. But you know, <laughs> Join the club. People saying, why are Christians afraid of COVID? Because, um, because you know, we, we, can't, we shouldn't be afraid of death. And, I, and I'm thinking, why would being a Christian in any way not make death, according to the Christian story, is the fundamental judgment of God against humanity. Uh, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what should. Um, I don't know anybody who's been in a situation where they're about to die traumatically, where they didn't think, oh, crap, I wish this weren't the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that is actually natural in the way we're supposed to be, that we don't want to die and that we're not supposed to die and that there's some other state uh, that's going to have to remediate this. But that basically everything that is the way it is in some way, um, 
if it's twisted and corrupted now, it can be redeemed in some way. And so that seems to be the line the biblical authors are pitching from beginning to end. Um, but then you have Hellenism is, has a very deep influence on Judaism. Hellenistic Judaism has a very deep influence on Western Christianity, not, not as much on Eastern Christianity. Um, and then you get these stories that have been boiled down in American Christianity to like, well, I know I'm where I'm going when I die. Like everything is solved by where you're going when you die. Um, mm. Which I think the biblical authors would just look at you and go like, I don't even know why that's interesting to you. Um, uh, or, or why you're putting so much stock in this. It's a, it's a skewed start, starting point so far as I can tell. And I'm a, I, I'm a biblical minimalist. So I'm one of those people that's like, if it doesn't say it in the text, I'm not going to invent stories to fill in the, the hole in the text. Um, mm. And if I can give one example of this problem, uh, when I teach Genesis uh, to freshmen, first year university students, um, I'll point out, you know, uh, Ad, Adam, the man, he uh, says, God says, it's not good for him to be alone. Then God shapes a bunch of animals, breathes the breath of life into them, presents them to the man, the man names them, but the man could not find for himself a suitable uh, mate, right? That's the, mm. that's the line in there. So then he makes uh, the woman out of his side and presents them. And he says, aha, uh, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Renowned story, right? So the uh, ancient rabbi said, how did he know the woman was the right one? Like, how did, how did he know that the human was the thing that he was supposed mm. to be uh, to be with? Of course, there's a little bit of sexual language in the text as well. So one rabbi, this is what I love about the ancient rabbi, rabbinic commentary. They're not afraid to say things that I think a lot of Christians would be afraid. Yeah. One rabbi is just like, well, he must have had sex with all the animals and then had sex with the woman, and that's how he could tell. <laughs> um. Uh. And so people are generally horrified by this. Like, how could a rabbi, you know, say such a thing? Yeah. Like, he, he's actually trying to work out the logic of the story. Um, I can hear all of my know. listeners at home spitting out their coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's Rev Eleazar in the Talmud. It's not me who's saying this, right? <laughs> and I just say, look, what he's doing is a very typical move that I see Christians do all the time. There's a gap in the story and they can't handle the gap. So they fill it with another story. He just invented another story to explain yeah. away the gap. So where did Satan come from? Oh, well, um, there's a gap. It doesn't say anywhere in scripture where Satan comes from. Gap in the story? Okay, well, um, he must have fallen down from the heavens. He must have been the most beautiful angel. Uh, he, he rebelled with a large army or whatever. Fine, those are great stories from Hellenistic Judaism that get carried into Christianity. They're not in the text, though. They're not in mm. the biblical text. Um, and so I just say the biblical authors, uh, although they are Hebrews and later Jews, um, they are doing something very different with these, uh, with these stories. And what I, what I force on my students while I have them in class is we're going to be disciplined readers and we're only going to read what they wrote and value that they thought that this was important to put it this way. And if they thought that other story was important, they would have added it in. Um, mm. and, uh, and they know how to use, they can tell these kinds of stories. They could have told it in a million different ways. This is the way they chose to tell it. And so we're going to respect that, that that is an inroad in the way that they think and the way they think you should be thinking about this topic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that uh, you obviously hear that a lot today, right? Like, you know, I, even I, I think back to when, uh, you know, I had questions when I was kind of growing up in a church and, <clears throat> you, you know, you might ask something like, uh, you know, why do we follow the, you know, kind of the, the, the way more of the new Testament as opposed to the mm -hmm. old Testament. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the kind of answer that I got, which I think it was kind of one of those, uh, answers that kind of, uh, older people might tell to younger kids as in like, I don't really know this, but here's something, <laughs> you know, it's kind right. of like, here's what I've heard. Well, yeah. you know, God came back and said, you don't really need the old Testament anymore right. because we're a new way of doing things. And it's kind of, where does it say that, you know, <laughs> like there, there's all kinds of ways that people will kind of yes. maneuver, um, you know, the, the, their stories. Um, you know, I, I only had, uh, one more question. Well, look, I have so many more questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, try and you realize it's dangerous to ask me questions now. Cause it, I don't no, know no, no, no. This stop. has been so good. 
we we haven't even um, really uh, jumped heavily into the kind of uh, links that you see between like hell. Look, you've you've been mentioning Hellenistic philosophy all the way through, so we've kind of touched on that sort of stuff. But um, one question that I really really wanted to ask is, you mentioned in an interview uh, that with some of your students, you get them to write down limericks about the things that they're that they're learning. Right. I, I have had an experience this year of, of going back to writing. Um, I actually wrote my first book and the biggest thing that surprised me about it, it was nothing like I ever expected to write because That's when true. I actually just to start, started to listen to what I thought would be important to write, like my dad's a poet and I thought, why don't I try and write some poetry? And it was one of the most valuable exercises I've ever, mm-hmm. ever had, but I don't quite know why. Why do you get your students to write limericks what is the what is the value that you see there for learning? Yeah, um, that's good. Nobody nobody picks up on that. Yeah, the that's it comes back to this question of they don't value. They, it's this weird relationship they have where they've been taught that this is the most important text in the entire universe, and then they don't actually value the voice of the author, what they're saying. They override it with theology whenever they can. They you know, they constantly explain away things in the text. And so what I do in my class is just force their head down on the text and say, no, 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 you don't get to lift your head. You have to see what they're saying here. And it's painful for a lot of people and and rightfully so, and it's not their fault. But when you come to something like poetry, we think of poetry as expressing this, you know, we have this German romantic view that it's basically this inner us is the real authentic us. And poetry is one way in which we can express the real us on the outside through language. But certainly there's some truth to that. Um, but as you said, you, you also realize if you write books or uh, narrative or poetry, that the practice of writing actually shapes you as well, right? That it's mm. a symbiotic relationship, that it goes both ways. It re- rearranges our mental furniture. Um, I found the same thing. I think you're a mu- musician, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So hearing a great song and then learning how to play that song, you get you it feels different when you're playing it than you thought it would when you're listening to yeah. it sometimes, you know? Um, and so I think, um, all I'm trying to get them to realize in doing a limerick is that poems have form and structure to them. They're not a free for all. I mean, there is some free for all poetry, but, um, and if you want to say something precise and rational and, and life, uh, and some, and it's often most of the poetry of the Hebrew Bible is uh, life or death stuff, right? Like mm. if you don't do this stuff, uh, God's going to crush you because you've been wicked against the poor or the vulnerable. So it's not like roses are red, violets are blue kind of stuff. It's very, it's very important instruction. Well, how, like, how do you do that? How do you get really important instructions down into simple poetic forms, right? So there's one really great way to get people to think about that is force them to do it, right? Um, mm. Now I should point out that most of my students didn't know what a limerick was and about half of them didn't bother to Google it. And so I got all of these they random They probably shouldn't. Poems. There's some filthy limericks. Out oh yeah. There. <laughs> well, I think my instruction said it can't end in Nantucket at any point. So yeah. 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 yeah there are some really filthy ones. So yeah. there's something about, and this is part of what I would say, it distinguishes Hebraic philosophy from the Greco-Roman tradition is the style of doing philosophy. And in some ways I think it's actually similar, but it's not acknowledged. Um, Basically in the Hebraic tradition, if you want somebody to really understand something like reading an X-ray, you put them through an embodied ritual with guidance and and keep on saying, now, do you see what I see? Do you see this over here? Um, The Hellenistic tradition, I think they also put you through embodied rituals. They just don't acknowledge it as such. They think it's all about rearranging the order of the soul or bringing some kind of tranquility in the, in the soul and the body becomes often accidental in their minds to this. Um, But so if, if that's part of the conquest is to get students to realize the physicality of writing a poem. I mean, how many people think of writing, of making a poem as a physically demanding uh, uh, process? Mm. Um, Not many until you struggle and struggle hunched over a desk and you can't like get a stupid five line yeah, yeah, yeah. into the form you want to get it. And then all of a sudden you're realizing your whole body, your neural networks, all the way to your fingertips, your brain, everything, your blood pressure, it's all involved in the, in the formation of this limerick in which you're trying to communicate and reason with other people through a po- poetic form. Mm. So that's one of probably the seven or eight things I'm trying to do with that exercise. But yeah, uh, that's, that's yeah. one of the ones that students feel when I do that. So. 
Yeah, no, I, I like it. I think um, it, it has such a, it has such a beautiful effect on, on your learning because it's like, now you have this thing that is just compressed all the information that you can possibly get. It's in there. And, um, and yeah, it's interesting to see those different traditions of doing philosophy. I think that, yeah, poetry is in a way, like you say, it is a form of philosophy. It's trying to tell us, tell important information in, uh, you know, in concise words. So, you know, Drew, this in, been... in ways that I might not be able to otherwise convey yes. uh, what's, what's being thought. I mean, I think there are some exclusively metaphorical and poetic ways of conveying thought that you just simply can't do by writing out the propositions. So. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to chuck one last very selfish question in here at the end before we end. Uh, you know, we've obviously also talked before the interview about, um, I'm, I know that I'm going to do a master's in something over the next few years. Um, the question is, is, is it going to be theology? Sorry, uh, like a master's of divinity. Most likely I would love to do something like that. I really feel drawn to, to really study this text. What, what's the biggest thing that you find, uh, new students, uh, what's the biggest mistake they make when they come in and, and start studying theology or, or divinity? Um, I don't know. Cause I don't have divinity students. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody studies divinity at my, well, a few people do, but um, yeah, I think there's, um, I think there's a, uh, with a lot of eager students, they want to, well, as the name says, they want to master it all. And they just, yeah. they just think they can glom on and, um, and almost as if they're collecting a bunch of thoughts and then they're going to eventually be able to spill them back out. And, and again, going back to the limerick exercise to realize that actually every lecture hour, every office hour, every conversation with a fellow postgrad student, it's actually forming you and shaping you as a, as a, as a thinking person in the world. Mm. Um, and that uh, you're not collecting information. You're actually being shaped into a kind of person who can see like the only interesting things I've ever said in my life is because I can see certain things because of experiences and, and crafting of other, the, the, the hard work of other people, including my wife who's worked double time to get me into usable form. Um, so uh, I think seeing it much more, well, here, let me tell you this way. And this goes to my last, the last question. I, when I started studying ritual, I have a couple of books on ritual theory in the Bible. Um, that's when I quit thinking about my classes that I teach as content and information that I want to get into the students. And I started thinking only about what rituals am I going to ask them to put their bodies through throughout the semester? How mm. long am I going to have them in front of a computer? How long am I going to have them in front of a book? How am I going to have them interact with the book? You know, I'm, I'm one of those, like you should be marking up a book as much as possible, including the Bible. Um, but really thinking about their bodies, their time moving through space and how that's going to affect uh, what they understand about the world. So that's mm. been just a massive shift in the last 10 years in, in my thinking. Um, and I think almost no student goes into it thinking of their education that way. They get very yeah. intimidated by these professors who know so much about so many topics and they might think naively, Oh, I want to be a bit like that one day, or I want to know that much. And they think it's just, toys to be acquired so that they can intellectually mm. play with them along the way. Um, yeah. So, so it's less about the kind of factoids, uh, more about the person who you're becoming, you know, yeah, yeah the exactly. things that you'll be able to see. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. Drew, this has been so fascinating. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to put links to, um, you know, where people can get your books in the show notes as well. Um, and you have a new book coming out soon on, on the kind Soon-ish. of Hellenistic. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, please let me know when that's out. Um, and you know, I'd love to have another conversation with you yeah. purely based on that book as well. Um, just around what you've learned there, but okay. thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really a pleasure. I'm, I've become a recent fan of the show since my friends have been on. Here. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fantastic service that you do uh, to the community. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching, 
based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.